You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello, and welcome to episode 320 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Benjamin Franklin was born in Boston on January 17, 1706, to Abby Folger and Josiah Franklin. Now, although Franklin began his life in Boston as the youngest son of a youngest son, he lived to travel in many parts of what is now the northeastern United States and the province of Quebec. He also lived in four different cities in three different countries, Boston, Philadelphia, London, and Passy, France. Now, in honor of Benjamin Franklin's 316th birthday, we're going to explore Franklin's life and times in London between the years of 1757 and 1775. Now, in total, Franklin spent nearly 20 years of his life living in London. He arrived for his first stay of about two years in the mid-1720s when he was just a young man. And with the exception of about two years when he returned to Philadelphia between 1762 and 1764, Franklin lived in London almost continuously between 1757 and 1775. So what was Benjamin Franklin doing in London for all of that time? Marcia Policiano, the founding director of the Benjamin Franklin House Museum in London, joins us to explore Benjamin Franklin's life in London using details from the largest artifact Franklin left behind his rented rooms in the house at 36 Craven Street in London. Now, during our exploration, Marcia reveals why Benjamin Franklin lived in London between 1757 and 1775. Franklin's work as a colonial agent, scientist, and postmaster general. And details about Franklin's room and life at his home at 36 Craven Street in London. But first, if you're a history teacher or you know a history teacher, you may be excited to learn that the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Omohundro Institute are co-sponsoring a teacher workshop on the history of Australia America. As the United States prepares for the 250th anniversary commemoration of its independence in 2026, the NEH and OI seek to help teachers look for ways to connect our current experience of nationhood to our early American history. They also want to help educators find historical themes that will connect the revolutionary era with their diverse communities. For more information about this teacher institute and how to apply to it, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash teacher. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash teacher. Are you ready to explore the details of Benjamin Franklin's life in London? Let's go meet our guest historian. Joining us is the founding director of the Benjamin Franklin House in London. She holds a PhD in economic history from the London School of Economics and Political Science. In addition to her work at the Benjamin Franklin House, our guest is also the global head of corporate responsibility at Relics, a multinational information analytics and events company. And she serves as the chair of the United Nations Global Compact Network in the United Kingdom. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Marcia Beliciano. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm really glad you're here, Marcia, because I know we'd love to learn more about Ben Franklin's life while he was in London between the years 1757 and 1775. I wonder if we could begin with having you tell us a bit about Benjamin Franklin and what brought him to London between those years. Well, Benjamin Franklin, by the time 1757 arrives, he was born in 1706 in Boston. He had become quite well known for his scientific pursuits. He had been interested always in many, many things, but he's best known for having a career that was about printing and publishing, but he was doing many other things at the same time. We can credit him with so many things. 
in the United States, he developed the first subscription library, one of the first hospitals, the first fire insurance company, one of the first universities, etc. And he was very busy and always very engaged in civic pursuits. But as he got toward his 40s, he began to think about taking on a business partner where he could pursue two passions of his. One was science, of course, and the other was politics. He became a clerk to the Pennsylvania Assembly before he eventually became an elected official. And he gets sent to London as the most famous colonial, we can say, of his day for his work on determining the nature of electricity. So he describes going out into a thunderstorm, as we know, with his son flying a kite and attaching a key to a ribbon and the lightning strikes and the electricity travels down to the key. And he determines that this is something that can be drawn from the heavens, but it has a logical explanation. This is really a great moment in the enlightenment because prior things would happen, but you didn't really know why. Here there was an explanation. So he gets sent to London in July 1757 on behalf of the Pennsylvania Assembly to do some work to convince the Pens, who were the proprietary owners of Pennsylvania, to either start paying tax or to get George III to take over the colony as a royal colony because there was expensive things happening on the home front, like the French and Indian War, which was essentially a proxy war between the British and the French. Franklin was indeed a man who was known for many things. And as you pointed out, he was a scientist and he was very well known for his experiments on electricity. He was a politician. And before he was a scientist and politician, he was a very successful printer and publisher. In fact, he was able to retire and bring on that partner at the age of 42. Could you tell us a bit about the impact Franklin's ability to basically retire from printing at 42 had on his scientific and political pursuits? Well, I think Franklin was always very financially minded. And if he hadn't done so well at his business, his life would have taken a very different course. But because he did have the financial wherewithal to pursue these other interests of his, we now have that figure of Franklin that we know of besides these amazing contributions that began in Philadelphia under his auspices and those of his associates. But we might not know all of the things that he eventually became known for in terms of contributions to diplomacy and his further writings that he would go on to do and the further experimentation that he would engage in. So whether that was in Paris with looking into the principles of mesmerism, I mean, he's endlessly fascinating, but his life would maybe not have attained the level of notoriety, but in a positive sense that we now know about Franklin as this very polymathic figure of which there are not a lot in history. When we think back, well, there's people like da Vinci who's touched in so many different areas, and Franklin is like that. And certainly one of the richest periods of his life and one of the longest that he lived anywhere outside of being born and raised in Massachusetts and his adopted city of Philadelphia was in London. You mentioned that the Pennsylvania Assembly sent Franklin to London in 1757, and they did this in part to try and convince the proprietary owners of Pennsylvania, the Penn family, to start paying taxes so that Pennsylvania could bear its own burden during the Seven Years' War. Could you tell us more about Franklin's negotiations and talks with the Penn family about paying taxes and about his other recourse direction that the Assembly gave him, which is you know, if the Penn family doesn't agree to pay taxes, they want Franklin to seek a royal charter for Pennsylvania from King George II. Yeah, well, there were a variety of types of colonies. There were 
royal colonies, which were governed directly by the British government through a royal governor appointed by the crown. And his son would later become, after attending Franklin on the journey and studying at the bar here in London, he would become the royal governor of New Jersey, but maybe more on that later. And the royal colonies originally were New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. There were charter colonies, which were granted to business, like in Connecticut and the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Rhode Island was another example. And then the proprietary colonies were charters that granted ownership to one person or a family, like Pennsylvania, but also Maryland and Delaware. So it was a reward to have a proprietary colony. And the proprietor initially was William Penn, who was a Quaker. But by the time Franklin is aware and on the scene, looking at the issues of defending the colony and making sure that it prospered and was well protected, it was the sons of William Penn who were in London. In fact, the location of Benjamin Franklin House is very close to where the Penns were. So we're at 36 Craven Street, which is just off one side of Fogger Square, which is today known as Fogger Square, in the heart of London. And then off of the other side, there was a place called Spring Gardens. It was a lovely home, and that's where the Pens were. And so Franklin was sent to London to work with the Pens, try to convince them to pay more of the share that the Pennsylvanians thought was necessary to defend the colony. And so that was what he was trying to do. But the Pens really looked askance at Franklin because supposedly he left Craven Street without his wig, which was not de rigueur at the time. And he would wear his Philadelphia homespun, kind of exploiting his colonial down-home image. And the Pens weren't really sure what to do with somebody like Franklin. They felt that he didn't know the right ways of dealing with the British aristocracy or very well versed in diplomacy. And, and maybe in fairness, he didn't, because while he had had other diplomatic activity, this was the first time that he was actually representing a colony abroad. But he felt that he had gotten as far as he could with them by 1762. So July 1757, he arrives and he's doing many other things when he is in London, but he thinks he's done all he can by 1762. And then he goes back to Philadelphia. But there's all this talk about taxation without representation and Franklin gets sent back. But when he gets sent back, he's not only the representative of Pennsylvania, he's also the representative for Massachusetts, Georgia, and New Jersey. So he has kind of expanded his representation of the colonies. I know we are really curious about why colonies like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Georgia really felt they needed a colonial agent in London. But I'd like to go back to the point you just made about Franklin dressing in his best Philadelphia homespun. And it's seeming pretty clear to the Pens that they weren't sure if they were really going to negotiate with a professional diplomat. They weren't sure if Franklin understood protocols, and they weren't sure if he really understood how to conduct diplomacy. Do we know if Franklin dressed this way intentionally? Did Franklin really not know what he was doing here? And I ask this because my read on Franklin is, is that he was a very deliberate person. And when he goes to France several years later, he dresses in his Pennsylvania homespun to really great effect. And he does this on purpose, knowing that it's going to have a great effect. Is this just Franklin miscalculating or is it really more of Franklin not knowing during this earlier time in London? Well, I dare say that in the 1750s, it was very much a hierarchical class-based society. And here is an extremely bright individual, but he is a colonial. And I'm sure that the Pens felt he was not their equal. 
Franklin felt most comfortable with what were called dissenters, who might not have been card-carrying members of the Church of England, people who were free thinkers, people who were curious. But, you know, Franklin, he had a great way about him. He wasn't in order, but he, I think, was someone that could engage effectively with all kinds of people. I think he was funny. I think he could be charming. I think he could be engaging. He was a good listener. And that was one of the things, right, that he talks about in his autobiography, which he writes the first part of when he is in England, supposedly to his son, William, but it's really what he wants us, those who have come after, to know about him. So it's like a PR document. And he says he never challenged people directly because he found that if he did do that, people got their backs up and you engage in an argument instead of a discussion. So he much preferred the Socratic method of asking questions and so forth. But back to your point about, say, what happened in France, at Benjamin Franklin House, we are very much about the story and not so much about the stuff. We have some wonderful artifacts, but we are really about this moment when Britain and America were still one and Franklin's critical role in trying to keep Britain and America together under the crown. That being said, we have this wonderful medallion by Mimi, and it shows Benjamin Franklin in his coonskin hat. And this was a very famous representation of Franklin. So I think he really did know how to exploit his image and his persona of being a colonist to good effect. And he was wildly popular in France and was very much the rage. And when you think about how others like John Adams, I mean, maybe if John Adams had been sent to negotiate with the Pence, they would have been, you know, much happier because I don't know if you could call him a Boston Brahmin in the 18th century, but he was much more austere and, you know, maybe that that would have been more to their liking. And there's all these wonderful stories of Franklin and Adams going on a trip together when in France and Adams already being frustrated by the fact that Franklin slept in late and seemed to be only interested in socializing. But little did Adams know that it was that socializing that gave him such a fantastic entree into the French court, which enabled them to trust Franklin and to part with a lot of cash, which supported the cause of revolution without which maybe we would have been like Canada or something, you know, a member of the Commonwealth. But this story of Franklin and Adams having to share a hotel room or an inn, maybe even sleep in the same bed, and somebody wanted the window open, that was Franklin. And especially in the times in which we live, we know that that is very important to have an air source. Franklin had very strong ideas already about the circulation of germs. And so he wanted the window open, thought that was incredibly healthful. And Adams was probably very cold and just not happy about the whole situation. Sometimes people describe John Adams as the crank of the American Revolution. You can understand why from that story. Now to return to colonial agents, it seems that Pennsylvania sent Benjamin Franklin to London on a very specific mission. Get the Penn family to pay taxes on its colonial land holdings so that Pennsylvania can defend itself and support their war effort in the Seven Years' War, or go seek a royal charter from King George II so that Pennsylvania can legally tax the Penn family's holdings. But why did the other colonies that you mentioned, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Georgia, hire Franklin to represent their interests in London? Why did these other colonies feel like they needed one of their own, an actual colonial, to represent their interests? Well, It really gets to the heart of why there was an American Revolution, because the colonies were under restrictions and they were taxed. They felt that they did not have a representative or a series of representatives in Parliament to represent their interests. And there were a number of things that, as they say on this side of the Atlantic, really kicked off the passions of the colonists and for a feeling that they were hard done by. And that was things like the Stamp Act, which happened in Franklin's second tranche in the 1760s. 
of the British administration deciding that they would put a tax on any type of paper, even playing cards. And then they would have these representatives to collect the taxes. It was hugely unpopular. And in fact, some people thought that Franklin was supportive of that or they had maybe helped to institute those taxes. His poor wife, Deborah, who was extremely long suffering, had to fend off angry mobs from wanting to burn down the house. But we can see in the discussions that happened in Parliament that Franklin was privy to that he was trying to get across to them that the legislators, that it was very important that they understood the position of the colonists, that they were engaging in activity that enriched the mother country, enriched Britain, and that they needed some latitude and having an opportunity to decide their own destiny. Taxes should just not be imposed. They were also restricted in the type of goods. They were meant to send raw materials to Britain, and Britain would do the higher-end value-added manufacturing. And this was very upsetting to many of the colonists who felt it was just unfair. So 36 Craven Street, Benjamin Franklin House, served as the first de facto American embassy. It was a place where Franklin could host people. It was a place that anyone who was calling in from the colonies, passing through London, came to pay their respects. People like Thomas Paine came to the house to meet Franklin, to get papers of introduction so he would know how to fast track into life in America and particularly in Philadelphia. So he, representing these colonies, was really kind of a lobbyist for their interests. And so they, in the absence of having some type of formal representation in Parliament, they had somebody like Franklin. So Franklin heads to London in 1757 to represent Pennsylvania's interests. And over time, he'll represent the interests of other colonies. But I'm curious, what was Franklin's journey to London like in 1757? And what did he make of the British imperial capital when he arrived on the Thames? So Franklin is always busy. His mother, Abaya Folger, came from Nantucket. And he had wonderful correspondence with his cousin, Timothy Folger, who was a sea captain during different trips that he made. Sometimes Americans are said to be a nation where a small segment of the population actually has passports, and those that do have them don't always use them. But here's Franklin going back and forth over a number of trips, beginning actually as a very young man when he has run away from his brother James. He was apprenticed to James, who had a printing press and newspaper business, but felt that. He was really chafing under James's scrutiny and wanted to strike out on his own. And so when he is just a young man who comes to London to learn more about the printing and publishing trade and a lot more about life during that period, but he's crossing the ocean numerous times. And so on certain journeys, for example, most notably on his return in 1775, you know, testing the water temperature and getting ideas about the Gulf Stream and looking at how ships are traveling the wake of other ships and just endlessly fascinated by making every moment count. And science is called in the 18th century natural philosophy. And there was just so much of it. I once asked a scholar, you know, why in this period did people do so many different things with Franklin chief among them? And that was because the person said there was just so much to do. And today we are very much pigeonholed as specialists in a particular area. But there you could just be curious and look at the scientific method and test and try. So those were the kinds of things that he was looking at, observing the natural world, trying to gain explanations for things that he was curious about, why certain things worked as they did, 
why ships might travel faster or slower at certain points or depths of canals when he went to the Netherlands, for example. In London, he found a fascinating city. It was the center of the world. And when you have come from a burgeoning town like Philadelphia, which was a very lively colonial center, it's nothing compared to London. And he is able to meet with like-minded individuals. He participated in coffee house life. So these were inns or other places where people could gather together and debate ideas, come up with theories, socialize. He loved this. And in fact, you know, later in his time in London, so as it's getting closer to 1775, you have to wonder, especially as he looked and saw that things were not going well for his affairs. Why did he stay? He could have gone back. His wife was asking, when are you returning home? In fact, she dies before he returns. He loved the life here. And maybe if it hadn't required a choice, then maybe he might never have returned or he would have gone back, but, but returned again. He had a strong social network. There were many cutting edge ideas. He was part of something called the Lunar Society, which was a group of friends like Josiah Wedgwood of the Wedgwood China fame or Erasmus Darwin, another sort of early industrialist who also shared his passion for natural philosophy. So many of these individuals that he could engage with and really be felt very comfortable. It sounds like Franklin really loved being a part of London's social and intellectual life. As you said, there was really no match for it in the colonies. And I do wonder if enjoying these venues of socialization and idea exchange also helped Franklin establish himself as a politician and diplomat. What did Franklin need to do in order to carry out his primary purpose for being in London? You know, it sounds like intellectual life is great, but that's really a sideshow for his main purpose of being in London, which is serving as a colonial agent. So I think he needed a home base. The house at 36 Craven Street, he never owned. He was a lodger, although it was said that he was less a lodger than the head of a household living in serene comfort and affection. And in fact, the household that he left behind in Philadelphia didn't look all that dissimilar to the household that he found in London. So he leaves Deborah and his daughter Sally behind in Philadelphia. He becomes a tenant of Margaret Stevenson, renting four rooms in this very workaday Georgian terrace house. And he also becomes a father figure and develops a close bond with Margaret's daughter, who is Polly Stevenson initially before she gets married. And he was very happy to be doted over and be in London. So having a secure foundation was very important. But actually, because his income was coming from Pennsylvania for the near term, and then when he comes back for that period between 1764 and 1775, also supported by these other colonies, and of course, as Franklin had his business partner, David Hall, he was also receiving revenue from that. And he had a crown role that he was able to hang on to for most of his tenure until things really started to go badly for him. And that was as postmaster for the colonies. So basically, looking at all of the detail for sending post. But that also got him into some trouble because there's this famous circumstance called the Hutchinson Affair, where Franklin is in possession of some letters that were written by the last colonial governor of Massachusetts, this guy Thomas Hutchinson. And in summary, those letters said, basically, these people in Massachusetts can be a bit unruly. We might have to send in the troops. And Franklin thought it was very important that people on the home front in Massachusetts that he knew, like Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty, should be aware of what was being said. But he did ask them not to publish these letters. 
but they were agitating toward revolution. This was just what they needed. And Franklin is not necessarily associated with the Boston Tea Party, but this discontent boils over and precipitates the Boston Tea Party. So Franklin is called to the House of Commons for a trial, which is supposed to be about removing Thomas Hutchinson from office. But instead, it becomes a kind of trial of Benjamin Franklin because they want him to reveal his source or to be chastised for causing all of this trouble. And so Franklin, back to his attire, supposedly wears his brown velvet suit, doesn't say too much. Franklin, again, not in order, but listening to what was said. And after the trial, one of his friends said, well, why didn't you say something in your own defense? And he said, well, they were throwing up all of this mud. I thought I would wait until it dried off his brown suit and brush it off. But it leads to Franklin's stripping of his role as the colonial representative of the Postal Service. And so that is a loss to his income. But he has this other thing that he would like to do. And that could also factor into why he didn't go back as soon as he could have, which is he was part of a group of people who were trying to get Ohio or what would become Ohio to get that as a land grant for a new colony. And so maybe he lived a kind of urban existence most of his life and he maybe fancied himself as being able to set out and help develop unknown lands in Ohio. But anyway, it wasn't to be. And eventually he will go back. But precipitating the the Hutchinson affair, there is a duel in Hyde Park between one person accusing the other of having leaked these letters. And so Franklin had come clean on Christmas Day of 1773. And he said, because he's really good at keeping secrets. I'm not going to tell you who gave me these letters, but I'm going to own up to the fact that I'm the one that leaked them. So that these two unfortunate individuals who were going to go back at it and try to kill one another didn't actually progress. But then there was a chancery suit out for Franklin. So for the latter part of his stay, he had to leave or risk being arrested. Franklin certainly had a lot going on during his time in London. And a lot of what he had going on sounds like it was really stressful to deal with, which would make having a good and stable home really key if Franklin is to succeed in London. Marcia, we need to take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. When we return, I'd like to have you tell us more about Franklin's London home at 36 Craven Street. Hi, I'm Christine Walker. I'm a scholar of early America and the Atlantic world. And my new book, Jamaica Ladies, Female Slaveholders and the Creation of Britain's Atlantic Empire, published by the Omohundro Institute, is out now. Jamaica Ladies introduces a new cast of characters to what we think of as a very well-known story. It shows that a diverse group of women were every bit as involved in slaveholding as the more elite and famous men that we know about. Identifying the contributions of thousands of ordinary women to the expansion of chattel slavery raises all sorts of new questions about complicity, power, race, gender, and violence. Questions that we're only really beginning to answer. Get your copy of Jamaica Ladies, Female Slaveholders, and the Creation of Britain's Atlantic Empire wherever you buy books. To order a copy of Christine Walker's award-winning book, Jamaica Ladies, Female Slaveholders and the Creation of Britain's Atlantic Empire, at a 40% discount, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Jamaica. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Jamaica and use promo code 01BFW. Marcia, would you tell us about Franklin's London home at 36 Craven Street? You've told us some about the location of Craven Street and how this Georgian terrace building really served as the first de facto American embassy. 
Could you tell us even more about the building and the layout of Franklin's rented rooms? So the house was ideally situated for Franklin because it's about equidistant from the city of London, which is the financial center, and the part of Westminster, which was the government seat where Parliament was, where the king could be found. So he was well positioned to get anywhere fairly quickly and to really have a place where he could be able to be visited by many as they were passing through. If he was, you know, in some far flung part of London, that would have perhaps not necessitated all of the visitors that he ended up receiving. It was not one of the grand streets of London. It was well positioned, but it is a very simple Georgian terrace building. Those houses were traditionally either two rooms or in our case, about two and a half rooms deep. That's it. And in our case, Craven Street was land that had been given back to the Craven family after the restoration of Charles II. So Charles I is removed during the English Civil War. Thomas Cromwell wants to establish a republic, but eventually the monarchists went out with the restoration of Charles II. The Cravens get this land back as a thank you. And they decide to strip away the stuff that's on the street, which was maybe not in good condition, some shacks and disused water pump and other things. And what they create is a street of respectable, but not grand, Georgian terrace buildings. And the street is eventually built out. Our house is one of the first on the street. Is circa 1730, but it actually remains today one of the longest streets of Georgian terrace houses in London. We're actually quite fortunate that we have a grade one listing, which English Heritage imparts for buildings of significant historical and architectural merit, because you can get a sense of the 18th century very easily in London. You can see a wonderful 18th century church like St. Martin in the Field, which was Franklin's backyard. You can see grand 18th century houses like Spencer House, or you can see houses that are just that much bigger than ours, like Dr. Johnson's house. So actually, the fact that this house, which was built on spec with not bad materials, but not fancy ones by any stretch of the imagination. We only have one room that has what they call dental molding around the ceiling. So it was the main reception room, which of course is one of the rooms Franklin rented. The rest of the house is just, you know, it's pretty basic. It's functional. And I think that suited him right down to the ground because he could function in aristocratic society of the 18th century, but he felt most comfortable in a building perhaps like that, where it was warm and he was in an environment of respect and friendship and, dare I say, love, because he definitely became this kind of large, looming figure in the lives of Margaret and her daughter. Franklin rented rooms at 36 Craven Street from the widow Margaret Stevenson. As we picture this Georgian terrace-style home, a building that is about two and a half rooms deep. What should we picture as Franklin's living area? What spaces did Franklin rent in this house? Yeah, so he rented four rooms, and they include the space that we call Franklin's Parlor, which has the lovely architectural features like the dental molding. He rented the room beside that which we call Franklin's Laboratory. And the reason we do so is because we found remnants of a stove. And then there's a small room adjoining that, which was another one, that he might have had his bed in that space. But we also found the remains of a damper. So looking at 
how he could close out the cold air because these fireplaces, even a small one, were very drafty. And if you could close off the cold air, then when you didn't have the fireplace in use, you could keep the room warmer. And then in the room that is the laboratory, we found an opening which is about two feet by four feet, and it matches a description that Franklin was sharing about how you could try and not send smoke out through the chimney, but down through a system of chambers into the fire, have an air source like an open window so that you could pull that heat with the principles of convection out into the room. He also rented rooms at the top because Franklin comes to London with two black servants, Peter and King. Once they arrived on British soil, they were considered free. King went off and found a place in a household somewhere up north. And Franklin talks about how he was, I think, learning how to play the piano and he was having a really great time. And that's what happened with King. And then Peter, his other black servant, there's a few nice stories about him writing to his wife to say, Peter and I rub along quite well together. And we look with one eye closed at our respective faults. And there's a story that we feature on our historical experience. So our main public offering is a piece of theater that runs through the historic rooms of the house and features with that character, Polly Hewson, who became this kind of daughter to Benjamin Franklin. And we use live performance and sound and visual projection. And in one of the spaces, we give a sense of the churchyard in Epton in Northamptonshire, where the Franklins came from. So that's where his father and his father's family have come from. And he is having his son, William, And Peter is giving them instructions how to clean the gravestones in the little churchyard in Epton. So I like to think that they had a good relationship, but it doesn't take away from the fact that Franklin has to answer for his acceptance of slavery and his maybe initially being apathetic about what this institution entailed, but actually coming to London and engaging with people like the minister, Reverend Richard Price, and other abolitionists like Granville Sharp created a watershed in his thinking. He was part of something called the Bray Associates with Dr. Johnson, and they were concerned about educating former Black slaves and just how They could help these individuals progress in life. And this actually began creating a change in his view. We know that nearly 100 years before the Civil War, Franklin's last public act is to serve as the president for the Pennsylvania Society for the Promotion of the Abolition of Slavery. And I'm glad about that. And I'm glad that he came to see it as a horrific aberration but we can't take away from how this part of our history is very much something that has to be discussed and addressed. And we do that through a number of different programs that we've had in recent years. What I find most remarkable about 36 Craven Street is that it is the only home in which Benjamin Franklin lived that still exists today. And I was fortunate enough to have a chance to visit 36 Craven Street years ago. And what was amazing is there are a lot of audio and video projections because, as we were told by our interpreter, Franklin packed up all of his stuff when he returned to Philadelphia in 1775. So it is not a house museum tour where we're going to find lots of artifacts left behind by Benjamin Franklin. But as you're describing the rooms that Franklin rented for us, I think you can really see, you know, in the fireplace stampers that he left behind and in other physical spaces that these spaces really tell us something about Franklin and his lifestyle, even as they are devoid of actual objects owned by Benjamin Franklin. 
Yeah, I agree with you. I think it very much is the largest existing artifact related to Benjamin Franklin. And it is some crazy twist that it isn't Boston that has the Benjamin Franklin house, the city where he was born, or the house that he had poor Deborah start to build when he came back for that second tour of duty between 1762 and 1775. And the only thing that remains of that house in Philadelphia are the remnants of the architectural footings of a building that was torn down in the first part of the 19th century. So it isn't in Paris and Passy, where he spent eight years representing a fledgling United States. It's London. And I have to take myself as a good example because I came to England as a student to do my PhD at the London School of Economics. And if somebody had just stopped me before I ever discovered there was this thing called Benjamin Franklin House and said, what do you know about Benjamin Franklin? I guess I would know what most American school children know, something about the kite and the key, something about a portly gentleman with some bifocals and not a lot of hair. My knowledge was extremely limited. But actually, digging into this story, it is such a vital part of both British history and American history, and it's a kind of hidden history. So what we need to do is bring out that story And you're right, we don't focus on the stuff because we don't have a lot of it. And there are so many wonderful places that you can visit, like the National Park Services, Benjamin Franklin Museum, which was initially developed on the site where the architectural footings are at Franklin's Court in Philadelphia, which has been redone in the last few years. It's wonderful. But what we have is this building and its architectural heritage. So Franklin, for example, talks about how he walked up and down the central staircase that we have, which is still in situ, and how he realizes that it's not how long he does the exercise for, but it it has some connection to his pulse and maybe his heart rate. And so no one gives Benjamin Franklin credit for developing the Stairmaster before we do. But his life in that building over 16 years was really quite pivotal, and the house was forever changed. Lydia would like to know more about Franklin's life at 36 Craven Street. She wonders if Franklin shared the living quarters that he rented with any of his family members. So Marcia, would you tell us a bit about Franklin's family and whether any of his family members stayed with him while he was in residence in London between 1757? in 1775. So the only person who actually came with Benjamin Franklin was his son, William. I mentioned about how Franklin is really good about keeping secrets because he never reveals who the mother of William is. Was it someone that he engaged with when he was in London? Is it someone that he had relations with back in the colonies, we don't know. But what we do know is that he was incredibly close to his son and so proud of him. I mean, Franklin's life was so interesting. You wouldn't have thought that a young man who came from a very large family, a fine and respectable family, but not a rich family with virtually no extensive formal education would become this iconic figure in history. But Franklin, he was able to overcome so many circumstances, like the fact that his son was illegitimate. And he was very proud when his son takes on the position of royal governor of New Jersey. And he's writing to his son, as things really start to heat up, Franklin recognizes that he has to make a choice. And this is incredibly painful for him with a mother with roots in America and a father with roots in England. He very much is of both worlds. But when it comes down to it and he has to make a choice, he decides that he is an American. 
But that's not the choice that William makes. William decides to stay loyal. Uh, Sides are taken. The first shots are heard in Lexington and Concord. And William decides that, you know, his father is doing something that he cannot abide by and that he feels is treasonous. William feels loyal to the king and he is eventually imprisoned in Connecticut after being removed from the state house in New Jersey. And then he is exiled to England and they never see each other privately. When Franklin calls into Portsmouth from France on his way back to Philadelphia after you know his last foreign adventure, they see each other, but they don't really make amends. And Franklin, in his will, has the last word. He leaves his son his papers, but not, he says, much in the way of money, no more than William tried to deprive his father of. So I think hearkening back to the discussion that we had about John Adams, John Adams also had a falling out with a child, a son, and how these individuals could maintain amazing friendships. But then sometimes the ones that were closest to home led to breaches that could not be overcome. Yeah, the story of Benjamin and William Franklin is a really sad one. You know, you had this relationship that was filled with love and filled with friendship. And, you know, there was just an irreparable breach caused by the American Revolution. Now, you mentioned earlier that Franklin did a lot of socializing, you know, especially with his natural philosophy friends, and that a lot of his diplomacy was based on the fact that Franklin was a good socializer and was able to have a lot of social interactions. So Leslie would like to know if we should consider Benjamin Franklin a party guy and what kind of entertainments and social events he would have hosted at 36 Craven Street. Oh, some great entertainment. I love imagining in Franklin's parlor, which is not very large. You can get comfortably maybe 15 people around a long table. I don't know how many he had, but he was having dinner parties where they would practice seeing sparks from Leyden jars, like shocking things. So I imagine there must have been a lot of laughter a lot of port. Keep in mind, this is the 18th century. There is no running water. There's very limited access to water. And so you end up drinking porter or what they call small beer, which has an alcoholic content because it can be preserved. And so I imagine it was very lively and fun. And Franklin very much loved a good party. When I asked Walter Isaacson, the great author who wrote a biography of Benjamin Franklin, because Walter has also written about people like Steve Jobs and Da Vinci, who I mentioned earlier. Who would you most want to have that beer with? Hands down, it was Franklin. I think that's a smart choice. I really do think that Ben Franklin would be a fun person to socialize with. Now, we've also talked a bit about how the American Revolution erupted during Franklin's 16-year stay in London. And Jeremy is curious if you could tell us how Franklin experienced the beginnings of the revolution while he was in London and whether you see any particular moment or event during his time in London that really moved Franklin to become the full-fledged revolutionary that he became. I definitely think that that trial, the Hutchinson affair, marked that transition for him of being a loyal subject of the king to becoming a reluctant rebel. Painful, difficult. He eventually had to make a decision, but it was not even in those latter days, not Franklin giving up. He was still trying. He was still trying to find that third way. In fact, there is a great story about William Pitt the Elder, who was the former prime minister in poor health, came to talk with Franklin about whether Franklin would support a proposal that he would deliver to Parliament seeking some mediation between what the colonists wanted and what the Crown representatives wanted. 
it unfortunately was not successful. So he had been using the weapon that he enjoyed the most, his pen, writing treatises, writing spoofs, creating cartoons, doing anything he could to try and just move things forward. I think Franklin could see that the two sides were not that far apart. If each would give just a little bit, bloodshed could be avoided. But when it became inevitable, and certainly when he is humiliated in Parliament, this so-called calling before the cockpit with Alexander Wedderburn, the Solicitor General, basically verbally abusing him and being stripped of his crown duties, he felt that it was time and he really needed to determine which side he was on. And so it was clear to him that he would need, as sad as that would be, to fight for the cause of independence. Benjamin Franklin really spent the better part of 16 years living in London between 1757 and 1775. There was a year or two where he went home to Philadelphia, but for most of that period, he was in London and engaged with London society. Plus, he also spent a year or two in London as a young man learning the printing business. So this is a man who spent nearly 20 years of his life in London. So given all of this time that he spent there, Stessa would really like to know about Franklin's reputation in London and the United Kingdom today. So Marcia, could you tell us about Franklin's reputation in London and the United Kingdom when he left in 1775 to fight the American Revolution and what his reputation in Great Britain is like today? When Franklin leaves in 1775, it depends who you are asking. If somebody had asked the pens, they probably said, good riddance. If you asked his close friends like Joseph Priestley, who had spent long hours with Benjamin Franklin, looking at scientific principles, Priestley is considered to be the founder or father of oxygen, then they were deeply saddened by the loss of their friend and sympathetic to the American cause. So it depends who you ask or who you would have asked at that time. But today, we are trying to do our part to make Benjamin Franklin better known in the UK, particularly for our young people who visit us. We don't have a huge endowment. Actually, we have no endowment. But it's huge labor of love to keep Benjamin Franklin House open to the public. But we make sure that all our educational provision is free and our core constituency are inner city London schools. And when you say to kids who know American brands very well, Nike, McDonald's, Burger King, whatever it might be, they don't have any sense of Britain and America once being together. So it becomes a really good catalyst for a discussion about, well, what happened to draw these two nations apart. So it's a really wonderful way of engaging about a shared history. That being said, if you are in a London black taxi cab and you ask the driver, I'm going to Benjamin Franklin House. Do you know Benjamin Franklin? Oftentimes, they'll kind of scratch their head, right, he was a president. But of course, Benjamin Franklin was a generation older than Washington, Adams, Jefferson. So he was never a president. Otherwise, he surely would have been. But no, he wasn't. But he certainly played and continues to play an important part in the history of both countries. Before we move into the time warp, I'd really like for us to discuss the Benjamin Franklin House historical experience, because as I mentioned earlier, I had the opportunity to take this tour and it was so refreshing, so delightful. I'm still talking about it all these years later. So I'd really like you to tell us more about it, Marcia, so that we can all be aware of what we can experience when we visit the Benjamin Franklin House in London. Well, we wanted 1730s Benjamin Franklin House to be a showpiece for 21st century technology in a house where you can't put any nails on the wall because it's grade one. 
So it was an amazing puzzle to try and use technology in this building. But Benjamin Franklin had said that he had been born too soon. He wishes that he would be able to come back later in time to be able to see what was made of his passion for technology and innovation. And because we didn't have a legacy of having been open, we only opened on Franklin's 300th birthday in 2006. Prior to that, the house was derelict. I thought when I took on this project back in the year 2000 that this would be easy, right? Benjamin Franklin's only surviving home in the center of London, lots of American visitors that come to London, U.S. businesses. Oh, this will be something, maybe two years to get completed. But of course, it took six years. And I'm definitely convinced that Benjamin Franklin didn't want his house to open on any inauspicious day. But how everything came together, all of the funding that we needed to find, it was in U.S. dollars, around Five million that it took to, you know, open the house and do all of the conservation work and keep the house running over those first years. So it's definitely been a huge labor of love. But because we didn't start with this is the way it's always been presented and we need to kind of keep that going by centrifugal force, we could take that step back and say, what would have interested Benjamin Franklin? And innovation interested him. And so our mission is bringing history and innovation to life. So we're always thinking about, you know, what would Franklin say? Would he be interested? And I think he would be so fascinated by the world in which we live today, where technology is so pervasive, but also, I think, ever civic-minded, wanting to make sure that technology is used for good purposes. Well, I, for one certainly think that you have made a great use of technology and the Franklin House tour experience. For those of us who have not yet been able to experience a tour of the Benjamin Franklin House, would you tell us how the Benjamin Franklin House uses technology to convey Franklin's story? Could you give us an example of that? What you do when you walk through the doors of 36 Craven Street is you are getting an immersive experience where you get the feeling of having gone back in time. That's what we want. You won't see any overt sign of the cabling, for example. That's happening under floorboards, through chimney runs. And actually, my favorite part of the house, which the public don't see, but if anyone did have a real passion for wanting to see it when they visit us, which we hope that they will, they could ask if it's possible to see our show control cabinet. So all of the cables and all of the lighting switches, everything terminates in two places at the very top of the building. One is an IT cabinet and the other almost reminds me of what Oz should have looked like with this cabinet, with these blinking lights. And it's amazing. This is what brings the show to life. We have the one character of Polly Houston, but there's certain moments when she grows quiet and then you'll hear the voice of someone that was important to Benjamin Franklin, like the voice of Margaret Stevenson, which is portrayed by Imelda Staunton, the Academy Award nominated actress, or the Emmy Award winning actor, Peter Coyote, who is the voice of Benjamin Franklin. So you see images as well, just projected onto the walls. It's something that people might find surprising. And we know that if you very much are a traditionalist, you might not be very satisfied coming to Benjamin Franklin House because you're expecting to see a traditional representation of history. But for us, again, there are so many wonderful places that you can get that. You can just walk right across the street from us and go to the National Gallery, for example. Or you could go to the wonderful Museum of the Home, formerly known as the Jeffrey Museum, and see wonderful period Georgian rooms along with other rooms from different periods in history. But Franklin were to walk through the front door of 36 Craven Street, he would recognize these rooms. It hasn't really changed. Thank you for that description. Okay, we should head into the time warp. 
This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Marcia, in your opinion, what might have happened if Benjamin Franklin's residence at 36 Craven Street had been torn down or destroyed? What would we lose in our knowledge about Franklin and the way he lived if we didn't have this one residence left to tell us about his life? On a personal note, I know I would not have spent so many years of my life working to get that house open to the public and now keep it open as a dynamic museum and educational facility. But I think it would be a great loss because we wouldn't put as much emphasis. There wouldn't be this small cultural heritage organization working to put this history at the forefront of discussions of early American history. You might gloss over it. You might not really have it be that relevant because you don't have a way of positioning Franklin in a moment in time when there was so much happening and that he was such a pivotal figure to. So I think it would be a great loss. And in fact, when we were in the conservation phase, we were the first place outside of the United States recognized by an initiative that was called Save America's Treasures when the house was derelict. So that was great. It was great to have that badge of honor and that recognition of the role that the house plays in British history, but also in American history. Marcia, if we decide we're going to visit London and tour the Benjamin Franklin house, which I know the pandemic keeps throwing wrenches in our ability to travel to different countries, but if we get to travel to London and we want to tour the Benjamin Franklin house, how can we best plan our visit to 36 Craven Street? Well, you can visit our website at benjaminfranklinhouse.org, and it's really easy to get tickets to come and see us. But we have a lot of virtual programming. We made the transition almost immediately at the onset of the pandemic, both from an educational point of view for children who were needing to homeschool, and we also offered lectures. And a good example of that would be Ben's Book Club, which we have been doing every month this year, focusing on wonderful stories of different aspects of history that have a connection to the 18th century or to 18th century London or to Franklin. And so this has been wonderful. You can be anywhere and, you know, tune in and listen. So I think It's definitely brought our community closer together and hopefully also widened our community. So I would definitely encourage your listeners to visit us and engage. And can I also recommend an amazing resource called Bloomberg Connects? It's a free app and Little Benjamin Franklin House is alongside some of the great cultural institutions on both sides of the Atlantic, like MoMA or the Guggenheim Museum. And you can download our guide and you get lots of behind the scenes information. You could also see our first virtual portraits exhibition where we talk to curators about the history of Franklin in various portraits. And there'll be more of that to come. And we also this have our own podcast, which is called Frank in brackets, Lynn Franklin Views. You can see what we're doing there, where we just try and pick up some of the different aspects of Franklin's life. And all of this information, plus details about how we can get in contact with you, are right on the museum's website, right? So again, that is www.benjaminfranklinhouse.org. Marcia Beliciano, thank you for joining us and for taking us on a tour of Benjamin Franklin's actual house during his stay in London. It was such a wonderful way for us to commemorate Ben Franklin's birthday. Thank you very much. The house at 36 Craven Street in London stands as the only extant building that Benjamin Franklin lived in. His birthplace in Boston, which is located just across the street from the Old South Meeting House on Milk Street, 
was torn down long ago. The space it occupied now boasts a commercial building with a Shake Shack next door. Franklin rented several houses in Philadelphia before he and Deborah, well, really mostly Deborah, built a house of their own in the 1760s. Today, all that remains of this house are its foundation stones, which are marked by the National Park Service with a steel structure that outlines a house. This makes 36 Craven Street all the more special. In addition to being a grade one historic structure, it is the only building that we have that Benjamin Franklin lived in. As Marcia described, there is much at 36 Craven Street that can tell us about Benjamin Franklin. Dampers and fireplaces and holes in walls where Franklin tried to recirculate warm air from fireplaces relates how Franklin liked to tinker and experiment with making winter heating more efficient. The front parlor Franklin rented with its fine architectural features, including dental molding, show us that Franklin was both a man of some means and a man who needed to entertain and meet with important people. And his renting of smaller rooms near the top of the house reminds us that Benjamin Franklin was both an enslaver and intertwined with the British Empire's participation in slavery and the slave trade. These spaces, combined with the Benjamin Franklin House's unique use of audio and visual projection techniques, remind us that Franklin loved technology and technological innovation, while at the same time, worked to place visitors like ourselves right in Benjamin Franklin's 36 Craven Street. Now, we may not see many artifacts of Franklin's life in this house, but the sights and sounds that Marcy and her team convey really allow us to feel as though we are walking through Benjamin Franklin's house and getting to know him and his work on an intimate and personal level. I really hope you get a chance to visit the Benjamin Franklin house. I really enjoyed my visit, and I think you will too. Look for more information about Marcia, the Benjamin Franklin house, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, all on the show notes page. benfranklinsworld.com slash three, two, zero. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoyed this episode and you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Omohundro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Jessica Brabble, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what other aspects of Benjamin Franklin's life would you like to know about? Although Ben Franklin's world is more about the world that Benjamin Franklin lived in and the world that he helped to create, I do like to feature episodes about our namesake because Franklin was into everything and there's so much to explore. So what would you like to explore next? Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.